as you can see in the picture here of the report. And the seabirds are somewhere in between. So they take up, well, of course, very small particles, but also those of a few millimeters. And then there are some priority two compartments, including air or atmospheric deposition in vertebrates and fish. And then some other compartments that are not, well, used for monitoring in that extent, but where future monitoring might be interesting as well. Um, there are also links to the regional action plan that PAME has developed. That's the protection of the Arctic marine environment, so a sister working group to AMA. And what is interesting here is also that different types of compartments are covered in these monitoring recommendations. A lot of work in the field of litter and microplastic is directed at the marine environment. But here we have also covered the terrestrial environment and the atmospheric environment and also freshwater. So in conclusion, um, screening approaches in the Arctic can generate data on the long range transport, persistence and bioaccumulation of chemicals of emerging Arctic concern. It's an important but um, potentially challenging distinction between long range transport and local emissions. So that is something we have to keep in mind when we design our monitoring. State of the art approaches combine target screening, non target screening and in silico screening. Um, the present coverage is rather limited in terms of compounds, matrices and locations. And Arctic monitoring, an Arctic monitoring program for litter and microplastic is under construction. So thank you for your attention. I will stop sharing then. Thanks, and Catherine. And then um, head okay. over to Penilla or should, and then we take questions at the end, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, then I take over. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so my name is uh, Pernilla Bolinitsetto and I'm a senior scientist working at NILU, the Norwegian Institute for Air Research in Norway. And I'm the project leader of the national monitoring program for contaminants in air in Norway. So we do uh, measurements uh, at three stations in Norway, in southern Norway, in northern Norway and at Svalbard at Zeppelin. And we also do measurements uh, down in Antarctica. So then I will sh also share the screen. Okay. So, can you see it? Okay. Yeah, uh, so I was asked to talk about challenges and requirements for sites now when we look at the new contaminants and microplastics. And more than requirements, I will talk a lot about the challenges when it comes to these contaminants. And uh, both Katrin and uh, Simon has already mentioned a little bit about it. So one of the biggest challenge when we uh, work with new contaminants, chemicals of emerging concern, as we talk about, is the indoor environment. And this is challenging both from the station itself and from uh, residence areas in the uh, neighborhood or, or close by to the stations. Because these chemicals, they are being used, for example, in the building materials as insulation for windows, as flame retardants uh, in the material itself. But they are also used in a lot of products that we use uh, in the indoor environments. Everything from our clothes so as uh, water repellents in clothes. The fleece jackets contain micro microplastic that can be released to the indoor environment. We have uh, food packaging, plastic bottles, plastic boxes. That can be uh, that contain plastics, uh, of course, but also chemicals. And then we have personal care products uh, that Katrin uh, mentioned, where we have siloxanes and many other chemicals in the personal care products that we then have on us and also in the tubes themselves. <clears throat> Sorry. 
And then uh, chemicals are also present in ele electronics, as we know, computers, uh, in our measurements instruments as well. So some instruments contain chemicals that we don't, don't want to measure with other instruments, for example. And uh, the cables, uh, electrical cables. So they are everywhere. So this is a big challenge when we want to measure this in remote sites. Uh, because I will show you, we have measured at our station Zeppelin. We measured indoors in the station and then we measured the chemicals outdoors in air and in down in the, the settlement in the New Orleans, just to compare the levels. And this, uh, here I show you three examples of uh, these chemicals of emerging concerns. We have chlorinated paraffins, which to some extent has replaced these PCBs. We have uh, flame retardants and phthalates. And for all of these compounds, as you see, the middle part of each of these figures is much higher than the other two. Which, so the indoor concentration, what we measure in indoor air, is much higher than what we measure in the outdoor air. So what we measure indoor at the station is about 100 times higher than what we measure in the outdoor air. And this is, of course, a risk then if we don't have a fully closed system that the samples that we are taking, taking from the outdoor air might then actually be exposed to this indoor air. And what do we measure then? Are we measuring the station or are we measuring the air that is long range transported? This is not only applicable to air, any samples handled inside, inside the station might then be uh, affected about the levels indoor the, the station. So we actually, when we present the data, we, we present data of what is present in the station. So this is one, a big challenge. So we have uh, in our laboratory, we have uh, tried to, in order to reduce all these indoor sources, we have analyzed a lot of different equipment that we used in the laboratory. And we found a few that have high levels that then we can um, remove and say, okay, we do not use gloves, so we do not use different products. Sometimes we find high levels in strange products that should not have high levels. And then we continue this study and we realize that what is actually the source is dust, so settled dust that is everywhere in indoor environments. One grain of this entering into a sample can then contaminate the, the sample a lot because the dust contain even higher levels of these chemicals than the indoor air. So the dust particles itself uh, themselves can then destroy or contaminate our sample. So uh, this is a big challenge as well to have it completely dust free would be the best, but uh, requires a lot of work. Um, here I want to show, this is a little bit complicated, but when, when we collect air samples, we have something that is called blank samples. Then we use the filter where we collect the air or the adsorbent, uh, but we do not put it into the sampler itself. So this is just being transported together with the samples, stored together, and then analyzed together, just to see if there might be something coming in along the way. So can it be something happening with the sample during transportation, storage, etc. So the triangles in these figures shows what we find in our air samples, why the circles, the black circles, shows what we find in these blank samples. These blank samples should have nothing because they have not been exposed to the air. They have been packed, stored, maybe opened very quickly and then closed again. But as you can see, sometimes the levels, the black rings are as high as the triangles or even higher. And this is a big risk because as uh, both Katrin and uh, Simon said, if we detect something in the Arctic, it sh shows that it has been transported there, long range transport that is per persistent. But if we also could take the, uh, detect it in the blank, do we actually find it in the Arctic or is it a false, um, false detection? So if we don't have control of the background levels, the blank levels, we have unreliable data, we have uncomparable data and in a way useless data. 
So this is very important to keep these blank levels or control levels as low as possible. Uh, so what can we do? What we have to do is that we lim limit the contamination on all the, all, the, um, all the line from the transportation to the sampling, to the storage, transportation back to the lab and in the lab, of course. Uh, what we do in the lab, for example, when we work with uh, siloxanes, which are present in personal care products in shampoos, creams, etc. Uh, we forbid, there's a, the person that works with the siloxane are not allowed to use any personal care products, not allowed to take shampoo, uh, to take showers, etc. And they are the only one allowed in the lab that day. No one can enter a big stop signs, etc. We have similar routines at some of our stations that when we collect the samples, there's no personal care products. Uh, and also when they you work with microplastic, they need to use special, special clothes or, or avoid clothes in order not to contaminate the samples. Uh, and it's important that we then include blank samples for those, for those matrices that we can, because that's the only way to see if we have contamination, if something happens, if there might be a risk of uh, something, something entering into the samples and they decide what we detect. So if we find, as I showed you before, we can say we do not detect anything, even though it seems like if we didn't have them, we would say that we do, but with the blank samples, no. So what we have to do is we have to plan before we start the monitoring and before we handle samples. Uh, we should talk to each other, share routines, experiences, and of course, we have to introduce new routines and new guidelines. And uh, all this to introduce a new measure can sometimes be not very well conceived, but we have shown that it works well. It gives us better data and they need to be established and they need to be followed. An example I can show here is that when we banned this use of personal care products. If we look at the highest, uh, the, what's it called? the column to the left with a new office called, that's a place, a normal office where people can use any products they want, shampoo, cream, perfumes, etc. Then if I ha find high levels in the labs, where we say it's not allowed, the levels go down quickly. So we see that it works. Uh, so, so it's not just um, talk, it actually works. So this has to be introduced for uh, on a broader scale and share them, discuss together. And uh, I think I just op wanted to mention this as a discussion point. So I, don't, I have no more slides. I just want to say thank you. And I'm happy to discuss this further with you uh, hereafter. Thanks, Manila. We'll, <clears throat> we'll have um, questions at the end. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen and do a couple yeah. more slides and then we'll get to the questions. Um, and I'm going to share my screen because I think I need to jump between applications. And um, has something come up now? Yeah, good. <clears throat> so um, as, uh, as Catherine presented, this is not just sort of monitoring for monitoring's sake. We, we monitor hazardous substances that we, that we know have effects on wildlife. And <clears throat> the goal is to introduce actions that will control those substances and remove them from the environment. So it's, this is important um, <clears throat> from that aspect. Um, it's also, I know, important in the interact sense that um, one of the, one of the uh, ideas of this work package uh, and work package two as well is that um, the sites themselves, the stations, don't become local sources of contamination. And the second goal is that we would like to increase the, the um, use of the Interact network in the contaminants monitoring world. So, um, as I mentioned, there were a number of sites that are listed at the bottom that in previous Interact surveys had indicated they were doing work on contaminants of some sort. Um, we're going to try and get a better idea of what that work is and, and hopefully we will enhance that as well. Um, 
yeah, the, what else would I mention? So <clears throat> I would also like to say that I know the Interact station is, is, is a, first of all, it's a terrestrial network, um, but there are air monitoring stations, there are coastal stations included in the network. And um, even if they're not doing contaminants work uh, directly, there's a lot of stations that are probably collecting information that is important for uh, interpreting the monitoring data, uh, including climate related observations, of course. So one of the things we have done, we've tested it at a few sites, but now we want to make it uh, more widespread in the Interact network, is a questionnaire. It's not too complicated, but it's to get a better idea of um, the activities that are ongoing at, at Interact sites and stations at the moment. Um, I've asked Katarina to send around this link to all the stations, but now this is where it's going to get tricky because I want to hopefully show a different part of my screen. Is that working that you can see a questionnaire? Right, I've, <clears throat> it's set up as a, as a set of Google Forms. It's not too onerous. It should take hopefully not more than 15, 20 minutes to complete. I would um, also emphasize that uh, we'll hear more about in a minute or later in the webinar, um, a survey that is being prepared under Work Package 2. So we don't want to get those two confused. There are actually two, two surveys, <clears throat> which we decided not to join together. But this one is concerning the contaminants work and it has a series of six main pages. Uh, and I can I, I hopefully navigate through these. The first is simple, who's filling it in, which station, there's a couple of um, pages related to whether you're doing any work on contaminants at the moment, and if so, what it's covering, what types of contaminants, what types of media. Um, if anybody has any questions, by the way, then feel free to contact me on uh, if they want clarification on any of this, and which programs you're engaged with, and <clears throat> what the what the um, basis for those is. It working for purely for research con in a research context, or is it linked to um, national or international monitoring programs at the moment and how and where data are shared. And then there's some um, a set um, <clears throat> of questions related to laboratories and sample handling. If you are engaged in handling samples that are used in monitoring work, um, uh, what facility is to get a, at least a starting idea on what the facilities are or maybe at some of the, the sites. Um, and whether any attention is being paid at the moment, for example, to contamination issues. Uh, then another important thing is we, <clears throat> we're we aware that um, a lot of the stations have close connections to local communities. And when it comes to trying to increase our work in relation to local sources, then some of the local communities that are being um, sorry, my phone's going off. Some of the <coughs> uh, local communities will be the um, contact points for things like wastewater, local wastewater treatment, um, sewage lagoons, waste dumps that could be local sources that would be of interest to the monitoring uh, network. So um, we would like to build up a picture of, of what your relationship with the communities is and whether that's connected with any feedback on monitoring. Uh, that's it, then there's a submission thing. So it's not it's not a long or complicated uh, form. It's a starting point at the moment. So I'm not gonna say anything more about that, but apart from encouraging all of you to try and um, complete that and hopefully as soon as possible. Uh, so that's part of the deliverables. Um, then coming back to something that Panilla mentioned, <clears throat> another of the deliverables that we have under uh, work package eight is to try and start developing some guidelines and some guidance documents or protocols that could be implemented. So getting this groundwork done is important to being able to prepare um, something that might be useful to you uh, in that respect. So then I go to this one. Hopefully we've left some time um, for some questions and answers. And, and as I mentioned, the idea of this is, is hopefully to increase the participation of Interact stations in future contaminants work, whether it's looking at local sources or, or these long range transported sources. And really here, I'm looking for any, any input, any ideas 
from your side on 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 how to approach that i mean do we do we base it on site manager engagement do we do we look or focus on you know this should be um something we need to do in connection with researchers who are visiting your sites um and of course i've already talked about the local community engagement um there are also other possibilities that we could explore um we've mentioned that there's big geographical gaps in our in our network we would love to have some sites that would set up some long-term monitoring programs and of course your sites are you know, long term they're not campaign based so certainly for maybe some of the fresh water um environmental samples the soils uh, your your sites would be appropriate and um, as a basis for some of the long-term monitoring um there are other things um Penilla mentioned things like passive samplers that could be deployed in in uh, some of the sites and or around some of the sites to give us much better geographical coverage than we have at the moment and apart from that it's any any other ideas so i'm going to just stop there and see if anybody has anything to say basically <laughs> So far, not. But Morton, you've got. I can't see everybody's um, thing, so you'll have to. I think people can just chip in if they have got something to say, because I can't see uh, chat boxes at the moment. <clears throat> Maybe try to stop sharing the screen. Then it's yeah, that's easier true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I noticed from uh, one of the maps uh, that Simon shows that it's uh, surprisingly few. Um, of the intake stations that are involved in the contaminant work. I, I think some of it is probably for a reason that, as I understand it, in Greenland, at least for the airborne uh, pollutants, it makes sense to um, do most of that at the Willem Research Station because it has uh, the right uh, position in on, on Earth to do so. Um, um, but still, it's it's quite few. Then, then I noticed in uh, Katrine's uh, presentation that um, you talked about this uh, <clears throat> non-target screening, and when you showed um, uh, where you, what point you have reached to, then it seemed like that there was not very many samples taken yet, and there was not very many uh, sites that were represented in in this work. And my question is then, <clears throat> how difficult is it to make uh, the sampling for such a non-target screening? Uh, would that be something that you actually could use, if not our uh, remote access program, then uh, some willingness from uh, station managers around the Arctic to actually do some sampling and send them to, to the laboratories because it would I would think that the expensive part of uh, a work like that is the machine that actually do the, the analysis. Um. Yeah. Um, yeah, the expensive part of the non-target screening is basically the data analysis, which is very time consuming. Um, you know, in this approach, you do not want to remove any compounds from the sample, so you end up with hundreds of peaks in a chromatogram that you have to analyze, and that is very time consuming. So that is the difficult and the expensive part of it. But of course, we always have the challenge with the logistics to get the samples from Greenland. And while you know that some of the colleagues at Always University, they are in, in Greenland on a regular basis and they can get some samples for us, but it's very helpful to know that maybe some samples could um, be obtained via this interact network. Um, in this specific project, for example, we were interested in getting water samples that were collected with passive sampling. And we did not know how to get them basically. So if there are any contact points then in Greenland or also other places in the Arctic that put, could put some passive samplers into the water and collect them again after a month or two and send them back to us, that would be a great help. So, so we often miss this logistic um, connection, basically, although, well, as you know, some of my colleagues are in Greenland quite regularly. But this is usually within these monitoring programs that Simon described and that I touched upon as well. 
where that are very biota focused. So as soon as we would like to have something out of the ordinary, for example, these water samples, the passive samplers, it becomes a bit difficult. The same also with terrestrial samples. It would be very helpful to know that perhaps we could have access to other samples through this interact network, definitely. I think an important thing there is also to, um, <clears throat> in addition to the contact, I mean, hopefully Vanilla's um, presentation gave an idea that we probably need to focus a little bit on training, whether it's training of site managers or training of individual researchers who would be involved in this work to avoid, you know, so, you, so that you get those passive samples, but you don't contaminate them yeah. at the same time. That's in, obviously important. And there's, a, there's some other things, of course, we need to consider that sometimes it's not very many laboratories that can do this sort of work. So if we're going to get the samples from from the station, from these stations to laboratories, potentially in other countries, I know there's going to be um, issues around shipping of samples um, between countries uh, that we would need to look into. And I don't have any good solutions to that, but it maybe your network has um, some experience and some uh, that we could build on in that respect. Try yes, to add, add a quick word on that. We have this uh, remote access component where you can apply uh, for for station staff to collect samples on, on your behalf. Of, of course, uh, the sampling needs to be fairly simple and be able to be conducted by the station managers while being experts in the field. But it's a way of getting uh, these samples funded, the sampling of them. Uh, and, and they have experience with shipping samples across borders. Uh, and that's a kind of, sorry. Uh, just to respond to that, I think that would be a very good start. And um, But as Simon said, this training component probably needs to be thought of as well. Um, in these non-target screening approaches, as I said, we do not really remove any compounds. So what is in the sample will then be detected and will be, uh, well, taken as an indication of this compound being present in the Arctic. So we have to make sure that this interpretation then is correct and that it's not really an artifact from contamination. But th that, that is uh, definitely a possibility to, um, and, and, and you know, there, there's simply an application procedure in relation to this remote access. So you have to define the project that you're interested in or whatever you, you are interested in and then uh, apply and then, um, the stations they provide the staffs to do the sampling. I'm I'm sure that if it's uh, about simple things, then at least it can also be a good idea, just to contact Elmo Marie or me, uh, and saying we could be interested in uh, samples from this uh, interact station, this interact station, this interact station, and then we can help you with uh, with uh, contact contact and. Uh, at least my knowledge of most station managers is that if it's something very simple, then they are very happy to help um, both within the remote access program, but also if it's not a matter of something that will take them days, then also uh, yeah, do something to help people just uh, without, um, without uh, getting anything. Uh, we have different, um, different examples could be there's a Papin project in which we sample uh, snow at many different uh, research stations. And uh, that's actually for um, looking at the um, isotope compositions of uh, hydrogen and uh, oxygen, uh, because that can uh, be used to calibrate models on uh, atmospheric um, circulation. And uh, and it it's a very simple procedure, and and I'm 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 managing a research station, so I I know, and and it's just a matter of that um, I have some vials, and then every time it has been raining or snowing, then I fill up a vial and I put it in the fridge, and then I make a sending of these uh, vials uh, uh, once every year or once every half a year or something like that. Very simple, but but of course if it's a network of. Um, Eighty-eight research stations. Then suddenly you can get something out of it. Um, yeah. Only you have your hand up. I can't see yeah. many other people. So if anybody else wants to say something, please indicate. Maybe in the chat box or 
yeah, a wave. Mean, now we have quite a few station managers on, on board here, so maybe we can ask uh, what what is needed if your stations should start monitoring contaminants? What is it you lack to get started? I can take a stab at that. Um, yeah. So hey, I'm, at, I'm at the Kluwani Lake Research Station in Southwest Yukon. Uh, we'd be very happy to to participate in any long-term monitoring projects. It's you know we have several already, but I think the biggest challenge uh, isn't isn't really staff time; it, it's equipment. So if there's any specialist equipment need needed, then that sort of needs providing. Um, but if that's provided, we you know I don't see any any barriers to us taking samples on a, a regular basis. Do you, do you think the st station managers have a good idea of which programs they are connected to? Um, or is it sort of just that somebody comes in and does something and and maybe the station managers themselves aren't aware that they're participating in AMAP or participating in EMAP or something? We tend to have, a, certainly at Kluani, we tend to have a pretty good idea of what people are doing. Um, we're trying to do a better job of collecting the metadata around our clients and what, mm. you know, what what information they're collecting and, and where is that being stored. Um, yeah. Because I, I, I mean, even in the, even in the first survey results, Elma, that you, you sent me that um, I think I had some question marks after a couple of stations like Villem, because Villem wasn't identified in that um, compilation as, as a site involved in contaminants monitoring. But of course, from our side, we knew that it is a one of our key air monitoring sites, but that might just be a mis, misunderstanding or, or a mis, um, uh Conception of, of how the how the question is posed or in in a survey or or how people um, chose can, to answer it. So we need to we need to look at that as well. I can explain that to you after the meeting. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the the placing of the questions. Yes. Yeah. All right. Because I think one thing that is could be an idea is that if, it seems that you have different components. You have plastics. You have non-target screening. You have targeted screening. And I, and I think maybe it's important to break it up in, in this uh, these guidelines here you're developing. What, what if there could be sort of different components the staff stations could tap into, uh, and and also what are the operational costs associated with this uh, to get started, the running costs, and mm -hmm. also addresses the equipment need Matthew raised. Uh, so I think that, that those guidelines with, with methodologies described and equipment needed and, and cost, that could be really useful. Mm. Uh, and, and then, of course, it's a, a dialogue, maybe also with you to ensure that the geographical coverage is, is good enough for what we want to achieve. Yeah, I think I think also, I mean, the role of researchers, that, I mean, you, your network is one of its main aims is to allow researchers to visit uh, sites and do their work. So actually to have um, some idea in advance of which researchers are involved in contaminants work and you know, which ones, are, you know, I guess it, they apply to visit a site with some description of what they're planning to do. And if that's contaminants work, we could kind of, if we had a feedback on that early enough, we could sort of try and engage them in the contaminants monitoring work, um, whether it's collecting a few additional samples or doing something a slightly different way than they were planning that would allow it to contribute to a, you know, um, um, sort of an aggregated monitoring effort. So I don't know how fast that would, uh, that whether that would be feasible or not. We have a summer student program every year. Uh, this strikes me, this would be ideal for them to, you know, Go out and collect these samples throughout the, the season that they're there. Yeah, I should also have mentioned there that I mean, there's a there's a big incentive to build um, community based monitoring as well. And that, of course, we've been talking a lot about very high tech, complicated monitoring, um, but there are also lower tech um, activities that um, we'd like to get local people involved in, um, partly so that they're aware of problems. I mean, it's it can be looking at issues to do with, for example, open burning of waste, um, which uh, not only pollutes the local environment, but it, it also would potentially contaminate the station if the wind's blowing in your direction. 
um, at the time. So wastewater has been used a lot in in some of the uh, screening programs as well. So access to, to the local communities is something also I think that the stations could um, help a lot with. I agree very, very much, Simon. I, I, I think the whole thing is actually to be aware of uh, the different competences being different places. And, you know, our challenge is, of course, to to inform that we actually have this network of 88 research stations that can be used for sampling. I would also say that in relation to, um, I'm also aware of that uh, community-based monitoring program or citizen science programs and stuff like that becomes very popular currently. I would also say that at a research station, it's extremely difficult, or at least it's quite difficult for, for those guest scientists visiting our stations to establish programs like that, because they normally have a 14 days or three weeks period to try to get the contact with the local community. But th there, it's also a very good idea to actually use the research stations that have staff situated yeah. in, uh, in, in the area and that uh, can kind of um, secure some uh, continuity and perhaps also better even speak the language of the, of, uh, the local uh, exactly. people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I can't remember what the time frame we were working on, Elmer, for your moving across the next part was, but I'm, I'm happy to continue if other people have things to say. Um, but we, we can also certainly continue this discussion afterwards. And I'm hoping that the session is being recorded, Alma, I didn't, <laughs> um, so that it can also be circulated to some of the station managers who aren't able to join this call because of the time. Yeah, we missed, missed the start, but it is being recorded, yes. Okay. <laughs> and we have until 10 minutes past if we have any, if anybody else has something to add. Maybe, maybe uh, I will say, yeah. Hi, hi, Elke here from the Sammler of Observatory in Austria. I have a question. So the WMO sometimes come up with a call for action. Do you think it would be also possible for Interact to write some kind of a short letter summarizing the targets or, or what should be really done? Because in Austria, for example, we have the issue that all our contamination measurement at our station is mostly politically driven. And it's done by the environmental agency and they control. And for example, we started two years ago in microplastic monitoring, but only due to the fact that we had some projects where we find out how much snow, uh, how much microplastic is in snow and precipitation at our station. And it was a hard fight to get the monitoring for this. So maybe if there's an international letter from coming from Interact summarizing a little bit the, the aim or, or the yeah, contamination we want to analyze or to measure, it would help to set up a monitoring at different stations, I think. Yeah, and we've been talking a lot about the, the Arctic side of things, but of course we're connected also in into other regional programs. So the, the we work closely with, for example, the EMET program, which I know your laboratory is, uh, or your site is, is part of, and um, doing this harmonized work and, and not duplicating each other's work and doing things separately uh, is part of that cooperation with these other regional programs. I think the the guidelines that we have on the plastics monitoring might be interesting um, in several respects. And of, of course, especially when you hear um, stories like Penilla uh, indicated that you know, nearly everybody wears fleece jackets. So if, if people are just monitoring how many fleece jackets are worn at stations, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be very helpful. So. <laughs> But I think maybe also if we come up with these guidelines or recommendations for contaminant monitoring at research station, maybe that can also be, be used to, at the political level to argue for, for, for the kind of monitoring you're looking for, Elke. Yeah, especially this long-term thing. And I, I really um, think that that's a, one of the big strengths of, of lots of these stations is that they, they, they're not you know, a three-year activity that disappears which is a, which is actually the almost the definition of the basis of the difference between research and monitoring in lots of people's minds research is just short-term funding and monitoring is long-term continuous so we try and move not just connect the two but move into some longer term work because that's much more useful uh, when you're looking at climate influences and things like that so 
Um, I don't, Penilla and Catherine, I don't know if you have anything you want to say before we switch off. You've got three minutes left according to our timeline, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much. I want to say thank you to both of you for, for joining this. I just want to point out something that I didn't mean to scare anyone with what I said <laughs> before. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's not impossible to do this, it just we have to, to think about a few things and maybe do it in a harmonized way. For example, if we take samples at the station, maybe we can always include measurements inside the station as well to look at different patterns or something. Uh, that, that's something we have to build up together. But uh, don't be don't be scared of what I said. Yeah. Just uh, keep it in mind that uh, the indoor environment is very important for these contaminants. Yeah. And learn from that each is. other. That's always yeah. a good thing, right? Yes. We yeah. benefit from each other's experience there. Mm. And I, I just think we have a, a, a task describing it nice and easily in the guidelines uh, for, for monitoring. So, so people are not scared. So, <laughs> but it was very interesting. And so thank you all for your, for your presentations. Thank you. And finally, just so you know, I put the, I put the, somebody requested the survey link. And I put that in the chat box as well. So feel free to, feel free to ignore the rest of the seminar, right? Elmer, and fill in the questionnaire instead. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Right. Thanks. Well, thanks, Simon, Katrine, and Panilla for the excellent uh, session on AMAP contaminant and plastic monitoring. So now we will continue into the, the session on waste handling at Interact stations. And I will just share a screen here. Um, <clears throat> So you know, all know that uh, working as a station manager, you actually operate a miniature society. So you generate the same kind of waste that is generated in societies. You use the same resources as normal household, but also the special equipment and chemicals and whatever is needed to run the operation and the research activities. Um, so, so there's something to work with and uh, here are some examples from the garbage fractions that can be produced at research stations. So it spans a lot from batteries, glass, uh, chemicals, human waste, fuel, oil, metal, plastic, fabrics, a lot of different things. Um, and, and you as a station manager need to be aware of all these uh, different fractions that you produce and also what should happen to the garbage. Uh, First you, of all, you want to reduce the amount of garbage you produce. You need to collect it. You need to sort it. You need to treat it or repair it to be able to reuse it or you need to recycle it. Uh, or in the final end, you need to dispose of it either at the station or to some uh, local or municipal treatment or handling system. So there are a lot of, of different issues that you need to be aware of and address as a station manager. Um, so, in this uh, session that we have here, we just have uh, invited two speakers to give you some inspirational talks. And uh, the first uh, talk is uh, about the waste handling system at Tulik Field Station in Alaska. And this will be held by Donny Bredhardt at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, and this is an example from a fairly large uh, research station. Um, and uh, the second, the presentation uh, will be on the government guidelines for waste handling at temporary field camps in Greenland. And this presentation will be given by Janne Fred Rasmussen and Kim Gustafsson from the Danish Center for Environment and Energy at Aarhus University. And they are the advi ad advisors for the government of Greenland and who have produced these guidelines. So they are the people behind the science, uh, uh, behind the guidelines. Um, and I can say that these Guidelines, they are related to mineral uh, activities. Uh, and the reason why we have included it here is that the size of these operations can re resemble the size of many interact stations. And also that these are uh, off grid, so to say. So there's no municipality handling of waste or emissions in any way. So therefore we, we found it interesting to, to look into those uh, guidelines as well. But, but first off is uh, Doni, who will introduce us to the waste handling system at Tulik. So Doni, 
the floor is yours. All right, well, good morning, everybody from Alaska. It's morning here. Good evening in Europe. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so yeah, so I wanna to talk to you about um, how Tulip Field Station addresses waste management handling. Just a, a small background. So Tulik is in the foothills of the Brooks Range in Arctic Alaska. Um, and, and as Elmer mentioned, we're not close to any municipalities. So we're like a little um, field, uh, a little village, and particularly in the summer. We, the Tulik station started in 1975, but it's been open year round since 2006. And we get between 350 uh, to 650 visitors coming to the station in a normal year but most of them come in the summer. So that peak in population in the summer creates certain challenges for waste handling, as you might imagine, with lots of different universities and projects, most of them supported by the US National Science Foundation, but we have um, other federal agencies and international agencies, including Interact that send people to Tulik and lots of plots and research sites in our vicinity. So one of the guiding principles for us for a long time has been the need to keep contaminants out of Tulik Lake because that lake has been studied for over 40 years by the Arctic LTER program. And it's a very oligotrophic lake, meaning very low in nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and so to add, for example, sewage um, treatment, treated sewage to the lake would be a problem even if that the water quality is good simply because we don't wanna add any nutrients to the lake. We also do have a, a small but growing atmospheric monitoring program at Tulik. We monitor um, the chemistry of precipitation. We monitor mercury deposition um, and we monitor ozone and um, a variety of particulates. And so we don't wanna contaminate um, our monitoring program. And so that's another challenge for us. Important to not interfere with that. So for that reason, our, our basic philosophy is that most of our waste is transported out of Tulik and treated elsewhere. And as I mentioned, the large peaks of population this summer create some challenges for waste management. So we generate, um, as Elmer sort of went over this, dry and wet waste or garbage fractions. We generate gray and black water, um, used motor oil, used glycol, which is used, um, glycol is used in, in heating uh, some of our buildings, and laboratory chemical waste and laboratory radioactive waste. And so for the dry waste, we try to get people in, the, in our kitchen to separate what can be burned and what can't be burned. So we try not to burn any plastics, but some paper type waste does get burned. I'll talk about that in a minute. We also have a lot of food scraps. Um, we occasionally get metal and construction debris when there's an upgrade going on. And we have, of course, cardboard, aluminum cans and glass, all of which are separated and then recycled in Fairbanks. So we do, um, sadly, <laughs> still um, incinerate some bagged wet and dry waste on site using a diesel powered incinerator. Um, that we do that with limited run times. We monitor the wind direction to avoid compromising our atmospheric measurements, which are located uh, off to the side of the station um, about maybe uh, 500 meters or so away. And when the wind direction is predominantly coming from the north and south, it's not so much of a problem, but if it shifts a bit, then we could um, compromise our atmospheric measurements. We transport all the excess that is not burned um, to Fairbanks, Alaska, which is pretty far away um, to be uh, handled there. We're trying to phase out of the use of our incinerator, which is kind of a historical thing. And part of that plan is to add an industrial composter on site for our kitchen waste, um, food waste but we haven't quite implemented that yet. Hopefully this year we'll get the industrial composter. The cardboard, aluminum cans and glass go to the University of Alaska in Fairbanks where we have a recycling uh, program and the medical, medical, sorry, metal, mental, metal, sorry, and construction debris are also transported to Fairbanks for disposal, which is, you know, there's a significant cost to this because it's pretty far away, 587 kilometers to the South. Um, but that's the cost of doing business. Um, so our water, so gray water, we define that as the water from the showers and the kitchen operations. And then black water is human waste. And basically we store that in underground tanks or in tanks that are underneath our, our outhouses, our toilet facilities. Um, and we have these really pretty big tanks, 45,000 liter tanks. And then there, the gray and the black water 
are consolidated together um, and transported by tanker truck offsite for sewage disposal at a sewage treatment plant, which is in Dead Horse, Alaska. That's up by the oil fields and so that's 2000 kilometers to the north. And so we have a contract um, and a big truck comes <laughs> uh, and sucks out, we call it the suck truck because it sucks out the tanks. And so it, it will suck out all the gray water tanks and then also the, the black water tanks. And you can see it comes year round. This was recently uh, in the snow. Okay, so that solves our, our, our wastewater issue. Um, again, at, at a cost, I think it costs us about 60, well, 30, let's see. The cost went down actually, surprisingly. So I think it's about 40 cents a gallon now to transport water out. The used motor oil um, and glycol, those, uh, the glycol, as I said, is used in the heating systems in some of the buildings in the kitchen. And motor oil, of course, comes from vehicles and also we have, um, uh, a, a big, some big equipment, bulldozer and, and loader that generates used uh, oil. And so both of those are regulated by the US government and we store them on site temporarily in 55 gallon drums. You can see an example of a 55 gallon drum here for fuel. And then they're transported by a contractor off site, usually once a year for recycling and treatment or disposal. The motor oil gets sent all the way to Seattle, Washington, <laughs> which is 4,000 kilometers away. Um, and the glycol gets treated in Anchorage. Um, so, uh, yeah, so again, like, like we don't do it, we take it away and other people do it other, other places. Laboratory chemicals are governed by uh, UAF regulations. The Environmental Health and Safety and Risk Management Department at UAF helps us with this. And they're also governed by federal codes and policies. And so if you wanna use uh, dangerous chemicals, toxic, corrective, or flammable, flammable chemicals, that requires prior approval of your use protocols by UAF. And you have to use them like in a hood, for example, store them in flammable cabinets or whatever. Um, and because there are a lot of rules also that govern the, the transportation of chemicals, and UAF is not licensed as a, you know, a transporter of chemicals. We asked the researchers to order their chemicals directly from the supply vendors and have them shipped to Tulik. And then the, the vendors will put them into the right kind of packaging that meets all the requirements. And that's a, a proved, you know, hazmat, hazardous materials transportation solution. Now the waste is a different thing that's even also quite strictly regulated. We're not allowed to transport waste ourselves. Um, waste is regulated by the government and we have what's called a small quantity generator site license, which allows you to generate um, between 100 kilograms and uh, 1000 kilograms per month. And you have to remove that waste after 270 days uh, on site and never you can never exceed 6000 kilograms of storage, which we never do. So we collect the waste um, in the laboratories. We provide these blue five gallon polyethylene containers that researchers can put their waste into. They have to fill out paperwork to describe what's in the waste. And then the waste gets um, stored on site. Um, we have a computer inventory and management system. And then uh, once a year, uh, the, the contractor comes, gets all our paperwork, um, and then transports it offsite for disposal in, in Seattle. So the waste goes, it actually bypasses the university and goes directly to Seattle. And then there are these, we put them, depending on what's in them, you know, we can combine some types of waste and not others. And they go into these big drums, which then can go into overpack containers before they get sent out. Radioactive waste is also, um, we do get a small amount of radioactive waste from our researchers that are using tracers in for example, aquatic studies to look at productivity in, in waters. Um, they do those experiments in the lab. They're not adding it in the environment. And so radioactive waste is, is basically, again, regulated by the US government and by university policy. And we have a UAF radiation safety officer who works in the Department of um, Health, Safety, and Risk Management. And so any isotopes that are used are shipped from Fairbanks to Tulik, and their use has to be supervised by that radiation safety officer. And then any waste has to go back to the radiation safety officer in Fairbanks. Um, and then she puts that stuff in, sorry, in a bunker. Um, and then uh, if, if it's, most of it is not like, it's not like, we're not talking polonium 210 here. We're talking, you know, carbon 14 or whatever. When it's decayed sufficiently, it can be disposed of uh, according to the, the US government. 
um, regulations. So it's very helpful uh, for us as a field station operators to have the University of Alaska sort of backing us up and providing all this um, chemical and radiation management assistance so that researchers can use these tools to address their scientific questions. And I think I'll just stop there and answer any questions. Um, Elmer asked us to leave a little bit of time. Hopefully I didn't run over. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Tony. You're welcome. I will stop sharing my screen here and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if you'd like. Yeah. Anybody got some questions they would like to ask or some clarifications? Maybe I, maybe I can start off. Uh, you said you had any incinerators uh, on site. Are there any what? requirements for what temperature they should be burning uh, garbage for? Um, they, we have one incinerator and it has a, it's a double burn box incinerator. So it has um, like a pre-burn and then a, a, a hotter burn to, to really try to get everything burned. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it probably does have requirements. I actually don't know the answer to that, <laughs> but in any case, it comes. Um, you know, it, it came with you know the the settings that it should have were all predefined, and it's really kind of at this point, it's kind of a legacy piece of equipment. We, I would like to get rid of it, to be honest with you, and so would the staff because it isn't that much fun throwing bags of trash into this giant burning chamber. Um, but the problem for us, the reason why we haven't gotten rid of it so far is that the peak of population in the summer can be so high in a normal year, and I'm not talking about a COVID year, of course, that, that we generate then when there, are, when there are 150 people in camp, we generate a huge amount of trash. And so getting it all out in a timely fashion is challenging. So that's where we think that the composter will really help us because we could get this, the food waste at least, you know, composted on site and that would enable us to deal better with the, the rest of the waste. Yeah, excellent. And then I was just curious to know, you have these big underground tanks for gray and black spill water. Do you have any problems with freezing? Yes, so we do. <laughs> Sometimes, um, so the the one that that the the truck was pumping out of the kitchen one isn't such a problem because there, there's always water coming from the kitchen and that keeps it warm. But the one that is by our dormitory, which is actually even bigger, um, often will freeze solid basically by the end of the winter and then it thaws out uh, in the spring. And so there's a period where we can't pump it out, but it has such a large volume that we let it um, we just let it freeze and then thaw, and it seems to be okay. Uh, the part of the issue is that we have a much lower population in the winters, so we aren't generating so much water and that that's what enables this rather low tech solution to work. It does have that tank does have the fittings um, so that you could put a heat a glycol loop around it to keep it heated, but for some reason that uh, is lost in the history of time that that was not actually ever done when the building was constructed, maybe it was a cost saving measure or something. And so it's not actually, we can't heat it right now. So it potentially in the future could be done, but right now it's, it's not. Do you have any, um, any issues with wildlife or bears in particular with, with waste storage? And then, um, and then I guess we going don't, yeah, we don't store any kitchen waste that would be smelly outside. Um, we used to have problems with bears. Um, but we haven't so much in recent years, but the, and that's another reason, I guess, why originally the incinerator was brought in was to make sure that there was no, you know, food waste that would attract bears. Uh, when there's a lot of people in the summer, there's so many people, the bears don't come around, but um, in the shoulder seasons, in the fall and in the spring, potentially bears might, might come by. And in the old days, uh, back when the, when Tulik first started, it was next to the Alyeska pipeline uh, construction camp and those guys stored uh, all their garbage in non non proof non bear proof dumpsters so bears would come around frequently and <laughs> that was always very exciting for the scientists <laughs> so yeah not so much now but we do try not to store any um, food stuff where bears could potentially get to it because we don't want to develop problem bears yeah uh, we we take all our food waste off site on daily because we have a, a transfer station fairly close by but we do some experiments with composting um and have occasionally had bears come and uh, mm, play with yeah. the compost balls uh, but they're, they're not usually a problem but it's 
Yeah, that, that would helpful. that'll be important for us too. I mean, our, our industrial composter will be inside a building, but what we do with the actual compost product, I think it will get sent off site back to the university because there is an active community gardening program there and they would love to take it. So that's great. Um, and we don't currently grow any food on site. Um, so there's, we don't really have a reason to keep it around. Thanks. Excellent. All right. All right. Thank you, Tony, for you are very the welcome. presentation. Uh, seems you're sorting a lot and transporting a lot. <laughs> okay. So uh, now we'll move on to the presentation by Jana and Kim, which is on the temporary field camps in, in Greenland and the government guidelines for, for waste handling. So Jana and Kim, you're free to go. Thank you, Elma. Um, share. Is it good? It's perfect. Perfect. Then I just need to see my mouse so I can switch. Um, okay, thank you, Elma. And you presented us nicely, Kim and I, so I will not say any more about who we are. <laughs> but I think I will mention, though, that um, uh, I'll do the presentation and uh, Kim is also here and I really hope that he will um, yeah, put in some uh, inputs and ask uh, and some comments because he was actually involved uh, in developing these guidelines I will go through some years ago. Um, so, so that's good he's here as well. Um, so, yes, I will give an introduction to the guidelines for waste and waste handling in, uh, in Greenland related to mineral activities. Um, well, you can say that there are three levels of guidelines. I've sh uh, showed it here in these uh, pictures. Uh, there's the rules for field work. Um, this is uh, valid for smaller camps uh, and include very simple rules for waste and wastewater handling. And this is relevant for small uh, work camps with less than 300 uh, person days uh, per year. Uh, and the type of activities that these uh, rules for field work apply for is typically related to geological investigations and very initial exploration activities. Um, in other words, small camps with tents and limited personnel. Then uh, there's the guidelines for waste handling from temporary work camps. And this apply for activities which are carried out under a prospecting license and an exploration license and supplement the rules for field work. And finally, for larger and permanent uh, raw material extraction projects, a set of uh, specific terms are made. Uh, it, it will build on the same principles as the other guidelines, but be site specific and activity specific. So, but, but in the following, I will mainly focus on the guidelines for waste handling from temp temporary work camps. Um, as you also said, Elma, in the beginning, I think this is the most, the one most in line with and comparable with the interreg research stations. So, but first, uh, just to give you an idea of the extent of the potential activities related to raw materials, uh, exploitation and exploration. I just included a map of Greenland showing uh, mineral and um, hydrocarbon licenses, the blue and uh, green shaded areas. Uh, the map is collected today from the web. So, but, but you can see uh, quite a number of license areas exist and both at the west coast and east coast of Greenland where waste and wastewater handling might be an issue that should be handled. Um, well, but back to, to the guideline, guidelines for waste handling at temporary field camps in Greenland. Uh, though it's named temporary field camps, these camps can in some situations uh, last for several years uh, until the actual mining activity starts and other regulations are defined for the specific projects as just mentioned before. Um, the guidelines apply to camps of more than um, 300 person days in one year. And I have included this small table just to highlight that 300 person days per year is reached quite easily. You can see 30 days and 10 persons. It's 
300. Yeah. Um, yes, and from a technical point of view, there's a huge difference by looking at camps with 10 people in 100 days to 2,000 people in 365 days in a year when it comes to the environmental impacts and solution. The larger the canvas, of course, um, the larger the risk is for, for an environmental impact. But at the same time, it's easier to meet environmental requirements with large treatment, treatment facilities uh, for waste and waste, waste water. Um, so this is also why in many places in these guidelines, it's required to submit a specific plan for, for instance, waste handling to the Greenland authorities. Um, also, the guidelines follow the principles of uh, best available technology, BATS, and best environmental practice for, for waste handling in uh, work camps. So these two uh, principles are described here, where BAT is the latest stage of development of processes, of facilities, of methods of operation, which indicate the practical suitability of a particular measure for limiting discharges, emissions, and waste. And uh, BEP is uh, the application of the most appropriate combination of environmental control measures and strategies. Uh, for both uh, BAT and BEP, for a particular, particular source or solution, uh, it will change with time in the light of technological advances, of course. Um, as well as uh, if we gain new knowledge and understanding of different processes. So uh, just as an example for, for, the, for the best available technology, uh, EU has defined uh, BAT for, for many sectors in so-called BAT reference documents, BREFs. And these are very concrete and on specific solutions. Uh, with respect to effectiveness and applicability. Uh, but not only BREFs, but also best available technologies uh, from other relevant and similar activities um, are basis for, for the rules and should be included in the selection of specific solutions. Um, well, okay, back to, to, the, to the guidelines. Um, there are some overall general re requirements uh, that should be followed, as you can see here on this slide. Uh, but most important of that is that a plan for handling of wastewater, uh, liquid and solid waste uh, should be submitted to, to the authorities in Greenland. And that the authorities may require uh, that the plan includes an evaluation of impacts on, on the environment. So these issues will be evaluated uh, for each uh, camp. Um, in the guidelines, um, specification for wastewater handling is also given. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so wastewater may be discharged to the sea, but only if it's, um, let me see here, yes but only if it's uh, at sites with su sufficient uh, uh, seawater circulation uh, and also subsea to ensure dispersion of the wastewater. And then again, this discharge must be approved by the authorities as indicated by this small uh, uh, red asterisk. And you can see I will, this small red asterisk will be um, shown in many places in the following. Uh, well, similar wastewater can be discharged to freshwater, uh, but only if in um, compliance uh, with these criteria, as you can see here. And uh, the criteria are depending on person days and the sensitivity of the recipient. So for very sensitive and large activities, there will most likely be requirements of cleaning before discharge. Before discharge. But again, this is determined for, for the specific case by the authorities. Um, monitoring the quality of the discharge water may also be required if the number of person days or the sensitivity of, of the environment justify this. 
And then for, for equipment, this includes, for instance, wastewater treatment plants. These shall meet the EU or US standard and be CE marked or equivalent. And then uh, sludge generated from wastewater treatment systems, systems could be delivered to a, an approved wastewater handling facility or discharged to, to the sea. Burial or sipping um, through the soil might also be possibilities. Um, but again, the solutions must be approved by the authorities. Um, then finally, for, for liquids containing harmful substances like heavy metals, explosives or radioactive substances, this must be collected and handled as hazardous waste and delivered to an approved waste handling facility. Yes, then the guidelines also mention solid waste and oil products and how to handle this. Um, first of all, uh, solid waste uh, products should not be um, buried or spread in the terrain or disposed to streams, lakes or at sea. Uh, it should be stored in a safe way. Um, some fractions uh, can be burned on site in a controlled uh, manner and if approved by the authorities. Again, this red asterisk. So this goes for, for food waste, uh, clean wood and paper products and oil. Incinerators used for this shall meet requirements to be approved in accordance with the relevant Greenland and EU regulations. And also the incinerator must be, uh, must be approved. And to assure an efficient uh, combustion, uh, the flue gas should achieve the highest temperature possible and live up to the specifications for, for the specific uh, incinerator. So I've just included a drawing of a kind of a simple drum incinerator, but, but as we just heard before, many different options exist um, and should be looked into. Um, Alternatively, food waste, uh, clean wood and paper products may be stored and transported out of the area to a permanent incinerator plant. But again, only upon approval by the authorities. And finally, um, environmental harmful substances and non-combustible substances must be delivered to, to an approved um, waste handling facility. This could, for instance, be the flyage from the incinerator and empty fuel containers and so forth. So to, to sum up on, on the different guidelines and principles that are taken into consideration for, for handling waste and wastewater in Greenland uh, related to, to mineral exploration and exploitation camps, um, specific plans and assessment of waste and wastewater handling for each product uh, for each project <laughs> should be developed and approved uh, with the basis of the principles and the guidelines. And this includes uh, focus on household chemicals to only use, for instance, eco-label products, no discharge of uh, environmental harmful substances and non-combustible substances, just to mention some. Um, uh, technology do exist uh, for handling waste and wastewater also in remote areas and in relation to an ongoing project we've seen that it seems that small mobile units both for wastewater treatment and as well uh, waste incineration um, at these relatively high temperatures seems to be applicable in the Arctic. But we will follow this closely. And we also try as much as possible to up to date. Um, and this is also why we are very glad to be here today and to learn from you and what you do. And uh, yeah, from your experience, um, yeah, simply to be most up to date. Then I just have some, uh, some, some links here to the different guidelines I've mentioned today. And this was very brief and all the details and uh, yeah, yeah, details you can see in these uh, guidelines. So thank you, Elma, and the rest of you for, for inviting us and <laughs> letting us join this very interesting uh, evening seminar. <laughs> well, thank you, Jana, uh, for an excellent presentation and some very interesting and spe very specific numbers. So very interesting to see 
Uh, so anyone in the audience who have a question for Jana and Kim? Otherwise I can maybe start off. Uh, you, you mentioned these uh, technologies that already exist that could be used uh, remotely, both in terms of incineration and wastewater treatment. Um, but but how, how do you know if they comply with the standards? How do you know if it's a high enough temperature? If, uh, are there guidelines for that? Or do you need to buy some, some certified uh, products that have an EU stamp? Or how can you get the, know, know that the equipment is, is good and well functioning? Yeah, uh, Emma, is Kim here? Yes, you need to, to buy a certified, um, certificated uh, product. And, um, and in some cases, you also need, for instance, to monitor the, the temperature uh, or collect water and, and test is the treatment uh, of the water. Is that OK? So it's both you need to test it by yourself, but you also need to make the right decision when you buy equipment. Excellent. Um, you, you also mentioned that uh, the, the wastewater discharge, if that could be disposed of into the to the river or, or the sea, it depends on vulnerability and circulation. So, so how do you assess that? It's, it's the de it de it's depend on the um, sensitivity of the environment. If there is any fish, for, for instance, in the in the river, it's probably not allowed to make any discharge. But if you have a river that is no biota in it or no fish and so on, it's maybe it's okay to discharge it to to the river. But it should not be any harmful substance. It should only be nutrients, for instance. Okay. And often we'll also ask for, for a, some kind of modeling or, yeah, uh, of, of the scenarios yeah. and make the decision based on that, that. And of course, also follow up by monitoring. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's maybe where some stations are challenged with having all these modeling efforts. That's, that's yeah. cost probably a lot of money to, to get yeah. that done. But, but now you're talking about monitoring of discharge. Maybe we can ask around to the research stations. Are any of you emitting wastewater uh, to rivers or, or lakes or, or the sea? And, and if so, do you have some monitoring of, of, of the wastewater? Well, maybe I can start maybe just to say that in Greenland, we don't have any wastewater treatment whatsoever. So sometimes the, uh, the mine companies are actually more challenged than uh, in general. Uh, so at our field site, we uh, discharge into a small river that uh, flows out to the sea. And do you monitor what comes out from the station? No, kind of uh, black, uh, black waste is taken back to Nuke. Uh, at a facility there, but uh, otherwise we just let it out in a tube. Okay, Vlodek, uh, you had your hand up? Well, in Horsen we have a biological sewage treatment plant, so so the water, it does go uh, into, into the seawater, but it's treated uh, biologically. Okay. And Morten? I was involved in uh, building up the second bear research station in Northeast Greenland. And uh, we started out uh, with plans of taking our sewage, all our sewage out. Uh, and then we ended up uh, dropping it in, uh, in the river. We had some calculations made. And I, I think in terms of nitrate and phosphate, it was, uh, we were down to, to two, uh, 0 0.2 percent of uh, the natural uh, level in the river and therefore it was concluded that it was next to nothing and uh, at least for that side that it was not really worth uh, monitoring because we wouldn't be able to measure it anyway. Um, okay, thank you. Anybody who's got some uh, more questions or comments? I'll just make one comment about on-site treatment of sewage. You know, we, we were interested in that some time ago, looking into that, but 
it's a problem if you have really big fluctuations in population, right? Like it works really well if you have the same number of people year round and it's a small number, it's very doable to treat on site. But in our case, like that just doesn't work for us because we have, you know, three people on site in the winter and 150 people on site in certain times in the summer. And the microbial communities just can't handle that that level of ramping up and ramping down. So that's one of the reasons why we just take it all off site to be handled. Um, so in addition to the concern about the lake being steady for a long time, because we're right on a peninsula that juts out into the lake. But I think if you were a small station with a limited capacity, it would be very feasible to, to treat on site. Yes, yeah, Sundonia, you're lucky that you have a road coming to your station that you can bring that truck in. Uh, that's that a very is big very advantage. true. That, that's one of the reasons we've existed all these years is because the road goes by and so it's everything doesn't have to be flown in. It, it makes a huge difference. Simon, did you have your hand up? I'm just going to ask, um, do, you, do you have a, an idea of, of people's compliance with, with rules and regulations, whether they're sort of guidance or whether they are sort of very strict rules. Uh, the, is it sort of a, a trust-based system or is there, is there any checking of whether people are following the guidelines or, uh, or not? I, I assume there's some sort of automatic sanctions, whether that's just don't come to the station again or, or, or for an industry, it must be a, maybe a financial penalty, but do, do people check on this or is it just sort of guidance um, and, and hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, Simon, in, in, in Greenland, it related to mining companies. They're reporting to the authorities what they do and what kind of uh, treatment they have and how they handle their waste. So in that way, we have a quite close control with what, what they do. So, but in other case, of course, there is some... Um, we believe on people, yeah, on, on smaller, very small camps, yes. Yeah, Martin? I could perhaps supplement that uh, I, I've been involved in um, research in the rem remote parts of Greenland for many years. And uh, in the old day, there was a kind of culture among those um, uh, working in those areas that um, once you had used uh, fuel drums for refueling uh, aircraft out in the field, then you just left them and you also, mm -hmm. also left the remaining. And at least that has been um, checked up very uh, firmly by the Greenland government so that uh, today you need what is called an area allotment if you if you place fuel in out in the field. And uh, you are obliged to uh, remove it, and otherwise you can't be invoiced for for having it taken out. So, so at least in relation to that, uh, the rules has become much stricter, and definitely you have to report that what you bring in you have to take out. Uh, but it's still not at the level as in Antarctica or or, or Svalbard um, in Greenland. Okay, uh, I think. Unless there are any burning questions, I think we should move on because time is flying. So I'd like to say thanks to Jana and Kim for giving this excellent uh, presentation. And, and I was really nice to see some concrete figures on the emissions uh, limits uh, and concentrations to spill water. So thanks for providing some very specific uh, numbers there. Um, then uh, we have 10 minutes, almost 10 minutes left uh, for the rest of the seminar. Um, so I will just, the next thing up here is uh, this resource use and waste handling survey that we will make. And this is uh, a deliverable uh, to EU as part of the Interact 3 project. And it will supplement the AMAP containment monitoring survey where AMAP focusing on the scientific monitoring, we will focus on resource use and waste handling at, at the stations. And the, the reason for doing this uh, survey is to, to help develop guidelines for station on how to reduce impacts on climate and environment. And uh, when we drafted this survey, we, we tried to hit a 
balance to where we could get enough information to to work with and uh, limit the workload on you guys for when you fill it in. Yeah, so we hope we have uh, hit the target right. Uh, we have very little time left, so I will just quickly run through it and maybe touch down on some specific points where we would like immediate feedback. And otherwise, uh, if we can take general comments. If you have had that and looked at it beforehand, you can take that at the end. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it, you're welcome to look at it after the seminar and provide uh, comments in, in writing. Uh, <clears throat> so just a quick overview of the survey elements. We have six major components. One is on the environmental policy and guidelines at the station, one on energy source and emissions divided into electricity and heating and transport, one on chemicals, water consumption, wastewater handling, solid waste generation and handling, and food waste. Uh, so here are a number of questions relating to the environmental policy and guidelines. And I think they are fairly easy to, uh, to address for you. So do you have a policy addressing environmental impact caused by station operation or visiting scientists? We have rule and guidelines on how to reduce, reuse and recycle to minimize environmental impacts. Um, and also how these policies and guidelines are communicated to visitors. And if you monitor resource use, emission, and waste generation at your station, and it's most of it is simple yes no questions, and sometimes we ask for you to to provide a little bit more details and free text. And the last question here is: Have you implemented a certified environmental management system at your station, and if so, which one? So these are fairly overarching questions that I think you can answer quite quickly, being a, an experienced station manager. Uh, then we move into the energy source and emission uh, on electricity and heating. We have a number of questions here. Uh, if you operate your own electricity supply system, your own heating system, if you have recommendations to limit use, either behavioral guidelines or energy efficiency recommendations for equipment and tools. And, and then we have this table here uh, where I may have a specific question for you because it, this is what energy sources do you use at the station? And here we have listed uh, different types of, of energy sources. And I ask you to provide information on what purpose this type of electricity is used for, uh, electricity, heating, or field instrumentation. And then we have a, a column saying approximate percent of total energy consumption. Uh, started out at a, when, when we drafted it that we had a kilowatt hours, uh, annual kilowatt hours, but I thought that was maybe a challenge for you guys to to find those numbers. But what do you think? Is it possible to get a percentage, a, a, a rough estimate of the approximate percentage of total energy consumption for the different energy sources? Do you think that's a way to go? Or would you rather have kilowatt hours uh, back in? Anybody with some views on this? Percent sounds good. Yeah, I absolutely agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> good. So we'll stick with that. Uh, and then we continue to ask uh, if you're connected to local electricity grid and what are the primary sources of power there? And if you are connected, is it possible to buy green electricity? Uh, and if so, do your station do so? Uh, and the last question is on fossil fuel, coal, or wood, and if you do some uh, cleaning on your emission before it's emitted. And if you do, then how? If you have some immediate reactions, please uh, pop in. Uh, otherwise, we move on to the next. Still, uh, Elmer, yeah. Um, I think gas is missing. Maybe some stations use gas. Uh, it's not explicitly stated, but I think it's okay. just fossil fuel. Yes. Good. Thanks. We'll add that. And also here. So this is energy source and emissions related to transport. What means of transport can be used to get to the station from the nearest international airport? Do you, do you guide or help scientists identify the least emitting means of transport or do you coordinate logistics to minimize emissions? What motorized vehicles are available for transport around the station? And what energy sources are used for operate these vehicles at the station? And then simple yes, no. 
Um, maybe, uh, Elmer, maybe you can include just a normal, regular, non chartered plane. Uh, yes. To a to a to a non international airport. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, charter plane. You, yeah, you have to go with charter plane to get somewhere. But you can also go to some stations without using a charter plane, just a regular one. Yeah. Sure. Elmer, also in the second question, I, I think, I, I mean, at least I understand it as two separate questions. Do I guide uh, or help uh, identify the least emitting means of transportation? That's question one. Or, or do I guide or coordinate logistics? Or do I, do I understand it wrong? I, I'm not sure. No, uh, I think you're right. I agree. Maybe let's split it into two questions. I think that's a good idea. Good. Then uh, moving into chemicals, uh, we're asking about what chemical substances are commonly used or present at the station and how are they disposed of. Then we list some general types of chemicals, um, then ask if they are used at the station, if you have recommendations for use and disposal, and uh, how the chemical waste is disposed of. And then it's, uh, you can tick off different solutions here. Um, so, so again, I think it should be fairly, the fa fairly over all general questions and I think it should be relatively easy for you to answer. And then there's just two supplementary questions and do you use environmentally friendly products? Yes, no. And do you recommend or require visitors to use environmentally friendly products? Yep, moving on to water consumption and wastewater handling. So asking about the primary source of water and if you treat water before and if you do, how? Do you have recommendations and behavioral guidelines for station staff and visitors to minimize water consumption? Do you treat wastewater? Uh, and if so, how? And where is wastewater emitted to? And uh, that, then you have different options for, for selecting different solutions. Yep. And I know we're running quickly through it now. So if you have time and want to, you can, in, in, you can look into the details later on and provide you some comments in, in writing. So we have a big table here on solid waste generation and handling. Um, and here we have listed again, general types of, of waste uh, and ask if you sort this type of waste at the station if you have some recommendations for, for reuse uh, and, and how you dispose of the different garbage fractions. So, so, so again, there's qu quite a lot of uh, general types here, but it, it's, it's yes, no answers and some fairly easy to tick off uh, solutions in the, in the last column. And we have others with free text uh, in the types of ways. So if you can think of others, you can always add those. Yeah. And then the last item was food waste. Just do you serve food for visitors? If yes, what do you do to minimize food waste? Or can visitors cook at the station? If yes, do you have guidelines for how to minimize food waste? A simple yes, no. And that was it. Uh, so anybody got some uh, questions? I know it's a rushed through presentation here. If not, I'll just uh, thank you for the comments along the way. And uh, if you feel like it, uh, look into it and provide your comments uh, to us in, in writing. Uh, by next week would be fantastic. Uh, then we will try to incorporate your, your comments into the, the survey and finalize it. And then we'll aim to sending it out in, in April with a deadline in May possibly, but we will coordinate with AMAP so you're not overloaded uh, with work. So thanks a lot for, for your contributions here and, and uh, lending me your ear to this. Thank you.
just apologise, Alan. I didn't I didn't coordinate with you on the sending the survey out. So I mean, we've we've <clears throat> it's a little bit different because ours is electronic. It's also available, of yeah, course, yeah. on paper. But um, uh, I guess it, ours will hopefully be out the way before they get yours. So I think that yeah, that so might help we, anyway. <laughs> we we could wait with sending ours ours out until you're finished, so we don't uh, confuse people. I think the confusion yeah. is the biggest uh, yeah. potential down here. Yes. So we'll we'll just wait till you're finished. Excellent. And then uh, I will give the word back to Morten. Uh, Morten, do, do uh, muted. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. Um, before we uh, uh, end the meeting, I, I will just um, advertise a few uh, uh, publications that has already been published or are about to be published, uh, and of which some are of um, relevant in relation to our discussions today. Uh, we published this uh, Images of Arctic Science, uh, a coffee table book late in uh, 2020. Uh, we have a new version of the Interact Science Stories um, at the publishing house now, I think, if it's not already uh, arrived from the publishing house. Uh, we have this uh, book called the uh, Interact Communication and Navigation Guidebook about mainly about means of communication and means of navigation for field use. Uh, it's in uh, the layout process now. Then uh, we have the Interact Reducing uh, the Environmental Impacts of Arctic Fieldwork. Uh, it's a short guidebook. Um, um, very much uh, in concept, very much like the practical field guide. Uh, it addresses uh, the scientists going into the field uh, and that is uh, out for review at the station managers currently. And finally, finally we have uh, a, a, a bit larger uh, textbook about reducing the environmental impact of Arctic research stations. And this manuscript has actually been out for out review among uh, the station managers, we still need to make a few corrections and perhaps we can also benefit from the results of uh, this survey uh, in, in the book before we publish it. So we expect that to be published within a range of uh, maybe three or four months while the other ones, they are pretty close to uh, being published uh, now. And with those words, I just wanted to say on behalf of uh, Simon, uh, Marie, Elmer and I, that it has been a pleasure to spend the afternoon with you and uh, that you must have a very nice evening. Um, do you have anything else to say, Elmer? No, just that uh, the ones who are having a nice morning, they can also have a nice morning. Sure, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. No, but, but also want to thank everyone for participating here and a very interesting uh, AMAP session and good input here in the uh, waste handling uh, for, for Interact Stations session. So thanks a lot for everyone for participating. Thank you also. And thank you. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Hope to see you, you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.